Y'all've killed me. Bastards, y'all've killed me. While the sun is still hot, I die. Collected on the fifth day of the week chat of the month. B-tab of the year 1171, 10 seconds before death. Subject was. A darkied soldier 31 years of age. Sample is considered. Questionable. Five years later. I am going to die, aren't I? Sen asked. The weathered veteran beside Sen turned and inspected him. The veteran wore a full beard, cut short. At the sides, the black hairs were starting to give way to gray. I am going to die, Sen thought, clutching his spear shaft. Slick with sweat. I am going to die. Oh, Storm Father, I am going to die. How old are you, son? The veteran asked. Sen didn't remember the man's name. It was hard to recall anything. While watching that other army form lines across the rocky battlefield, that lining up seemed so civil, neat, organized. Short spears in the front ranks, long spears and javelins next, archers at the sides. The darkied spearmen wore equipment, like Sen's leather jerkin and knee-length skirt with a simple steel cap and a matching breastplate. Many of the lighter always had full suits of armor. They sat astride. Horses, their honor guards clustering around them with breastplates that gleamed burgundy and deep forest green. Were there shard bearers among them? Bright Lord Amaram. Wasn't a shard bearer. Were any of his men? What if Sen? Had to fight one? Ordinary men didn't kill shard bearers. It had happened so infrequently that each occurrence was now legendary. It's really happening, he thought with mounting terror. This wasn't a drill in the camp. This wasn't training out in the fields, swinging sticks. This was real. Facing that fact his heart. Pounding like a frightened animal into his chest, his legs. Unsteady Sen suddenly realized that he was a coward. He shouldn't have left the herds. He should never have. Son, the veteran said, voice firm. How old are you? Fifteen, sir. And what's your name? Sen, sir. The mountain is, bearded man nodded. I am Dalit. Dalit, Sen repeated, still staring out at the other army. There were so many of them. Thousands. I am going to die. Aren't I? No. Dalit had a gruff voice, but somehow that was comforting. You're going to be just fine. Keep your head on. Straight. Stay with the squad. But I've barely had three months training, he swore he could hear faint clangs from the enemy's armor or shields. Capital I. Can barely hold this spear. Storm Father, I am dead. I can't. Son, Dalit interrupted, soft but firm. He raised a hand and placed it on Sen's shoulder. The rim of Dalit's large round shield reflected the light from where it hung on his back. You are going to be fine. How can you know? It came out as a plea. Because, lad, you're in Kaladin Stormblast squad. The other soldiers nearby nodded in agreement. Behind them, Waves and waves of soldiers were lining up thousands of them. Sen was right at the front, with Kaladin's squad of about 30 other men. Why had Sen been moved to a new squad at the last moment? It had something to do with camp politics. Why was this squad at the very front, where casualties were bound to be the greatest? Small fursprin like globs of purplish goop began to climb up out of the ground and gather around his feet. In a moment of sheer panic, he nearly dropped his spear and scrambled away. Dalit's hand tightened on his shoulder. Looking up into Dalit's confident black eyes, Sen hesitated. Did you piss before we formed drinks? Dalit asked. I didn't have time to go now. Here? Ten orders. We were loved once. Why have you forsaken us, almighty shard of my soul? Where have you gone? Collected on the second day of Kakash, year 1171, 5, seconds before death. Subject was a lighted woman in her third decade. Eight months later, Kaladin's stomach growled as he reached through the bars and accepted the bowl of slop. He pulled the small bowl mora cup between the bars, sniffed it, then grimaced as the caged wagon began to roll again. The sludgy gray slop was made 
from overcooked talu grain, and this batch was flecked with crusted bits of yesterday's meal. Revolting though it was, it was all he would get. He began to eat, legs hanging out between the bars, watching the scenery pass. The other slaves in his cage clutched their bowls, protectively, afraid that someone might steal from them. One of them tried to steal Kaladin's food on the first day. Head nearly broken the man's arm. Now everyone left him alone. Suited him just fine. He ate with his fingers, careless of the dirt. Head stopped. Noticing dirt months ago, he hated that he felt some of that same paranoia that the others showed. How could he not? After eight months of beatings, deprivation, and brutality, he fought down the paranoia. He won't become like them. Even if he had given up everything else, even if all had been taken from him, even if there was no longer hope of escape, this one thing he would retain. He was a slave. But he didn't need to think like one. He finished the slop quickly. Nearby, one of the other slaves began to cough weakly. There were ten slaves in the wagon. All men, scraggly bearded and dirty. It was one of three. A man stood on a cliffside and watched his homeland fall into dust. The waters surged beneath, so far beneath, and he heard a child crying. They were his own tears. Collected on the 4th of Tanates, year 1171, 30 seconds, before death. Subject was a cobbler of some renown. Car brand, City of Bells, was not a place that Shallon had ever imagined she would visit. Though she had often dreamed of traveling, she had expected to spend her early life sequestered in her family's manor, only escaping through the books of her father's library. She had expected to marry one of her father's allies, then spend the rest of her life sequestered in his manor, but expectations were like fine pottery. The harder you held them, the more likely they were to crack. She found herself breathless, clutching her leather bound. Drawing pad to her chest as longshoremen pulled the ship into the dock. Car Branth was enormous. Built up the side of a steep incline, the city was wedge-shaped, as if it were built into a wide crack, with the open side toward the ocean. The buildings were blocky, with square windows, and appeared to have been constructed of some kind of mud or daub. Creme. Perhaps. They were painted bright colors, reds and oranges. Most often, but occasional blues and yellows too. She could hear the bells already, tinkling in the wind, ringing, with pure voices. She had to strain their neck to look up, toward the city's loftiest rim. Car Branth was like a mountain, towering over her. How many people lived in a place like this? Thousands? Tens of thousands? She shivered again daunted. Yet Exidith then blinked pointedly, fixing the image of the city, in her memory. Sailors rushed about, the wind's pleasure was an arrow. Single-masted vessel, barely large enough for her, the captain. I am dying, aren't I, healer, why do you take my blood? Who is that beside you, with his head of lines? I can see a distant sun, dark and cold, shining in a black sky, collected on the third of Jesnan. 1172, 11 seconds pre-death. Subject was a Rishi Chul trainer. Sample is of particular note. Why don't you cry? The wind sprint asked. Kaladin sat with his back to the corner of the cage, looking down. The floor planks in front of him were splintered, as if someone had dug at them with nothing but his fingernails. The splintered section was stained dark where the dry gray wood had soaked up blood. A futile, delusional attempt at escape. 
The wagon continued to roll, the same routine each day. Wake up sore and aching from a fitful night spent without mattress or blanket. One wagon at a time, the slaves were let out and hobbled with leg irons and given time to shuffle around and relieve themselves. Then they were packed away and given morning slop, and the wagons rolled until afternoon. Slop. More rolling. Evening slop, then a ladle of water before sleep. Kaladin's shash brand was still cracked and bleeding, at least. The cage's top gave shade from the sun. The wind sprints shifted to mist, floating like a tiny cloud. She moved in close to Kaladin, the motion outlining her face at the front of the cloud, as if blowing back the fog and revealing something more substantial underneath. Vaporous, feminine, and angular. With such curious eyes, like no other sprint head, seen. The others cry at night, she said, but you don't. Why cry, he said, leaning his head back against the bars. What would it change? I don't know. Why do men cry? I have seen the end, and have heard it named. The night of sorrows, the true desolation. The Everstorm. Collected on the first of Nains, 1172, 15 seconds pre-death. Subject was a dark-eyed youth of unknown origin. Shallon had not expected Jesna Collin to be so beautiful. It was a stately, mature Beatias one might find in the portrait of some historical scholar. Shallon realized that she'd naively been expecting Jesna to be an ugly spinster, like the stern matrons who had tutored her years ago. How else could one picture a heretic well into her mid-thirties and still unmarried? Jesna was nothing like that. She was tall and slender, with clear skin, narrow black eyebrows, and thick, deep onyx hair. She wore part of it up, wrapped around a small, scroll-shaped, golden ornament with two long hairpins holding it in place. The rest tumbled down behind her neck in small, tight curls, even twisted and curled as it was, it came down to Jesna's shoulders if left unbound, it would be as long as Shallon's hair, reaching past the middle of her back. She had a squarish face and discriminating pale violet eyes. She was listening to a man dressed in robes of burnt orange, and white, the Carbranthian royal colors, brightness Colin, was several fingers taller than the man apparently, the Alethi. Reputation for height was no exaggeration. Jasna glanced at Shallon, noting her, then returned to her conversation. Storm Father This woman was the sister of a king, reserved, statuesque, dressed immaculately in blue and silver, like The waist, falling generously to the floor. Her sleeves were long and stately, and the left one was, I am cold. Mother, I am cold. Mother? Why can I still hear the rain? Will it stop? Collected on Vevish's, 1172, 32 seconds pre-death. Subject. Was a lighted female child, approximately six years old. Vlack released all of the slaves from their cages at once. This time, he didn't fear runaways or a slave rebellion with nothing but wilderness behind them and over a hundred thousand armed soldiers just ahead. Kaladin stepped down from the wagon. They were inside one. 
of the crater-like formations, its jagged stone wall rising just to the east. The ground had been cleared of plant life, and the rock was slick beneath his unshod feet. Pools of rainwater had gathered in depressions. The air was crisp and clean, and the sun strong overhead, though with this eastern humidity, he always felt damp. Around them spread the signs of an army long settled. This war had been going on since the old king's death, nearly six years ago. Everyone told stories of that night, the night when Parshendi tribesmen had murdered King Gavilar. Squads of soldiers marched by, following directions indicated by painted circles at each intersection. The camp was packed with long stone bunkers, and there were more tents than Kaladin had discerned from above. So casters couldn't be used to create every shelter. After the stink of the slave caravan, the place smelled good brimming with familiar scents like treated leather and oiled weapons. However, many of the soldiers had a disorderly look. They weren't dirty, but they didn't seem particularly disciplined either. They roamed the camp in packs, with coats undone. Some pointed and jeered at the slaves. This was the army of a high prince. The elite force that fought for, they are aflame, they burn, they bring the darkness when, they come, and so all you can see is that their skin is aflame, burn, 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 collected on Palatishev, 1172, 21 seconds pre-death, subject, was a baker's apprentice. Shallon hurried down the hallway with its burnt orange, colorings, the ceiling and upper walls now stained by the, Passing of black smoke from Jasna's sowl casting, hopefully. The paintings on the walls hadn't been ruined. Ahead, a small group of parchment arrived, bearing rags, buckets, and step ladders to use in wiping off the soot. They bowed to her as she passed, uttering no words.